So welcome everyone to Obelisk Support's latest Move the Needle webinar. I'm Lucinda Ackland, Obelisk Support's Learning and Development Consultant. And today we're going to discuss making a great impact, how to inspire confidence as a freelance legal consultant. And the aim is to give you practical advice and strategies to support you in the life cycle of a role and discuss some of the challenges that you might face and indeed how to manage them. Essentially, this is to help you develop your skills in your roles as freelance legal professionals. And we're lucky today to be joined by two great guests, David Roylands, author, award-winning coach, whose clients include American Express, Bupa, Zurich and The Telegraph. And he is uh, publishing a book shortly, Be Seen, Be Heard and Get Paid for What You're Worth. Excellent title there, together with Charlene Sequeira, also an executive coach and one of Obelisk's consultants. She is an experienced commercial lawyer who worked at Shearman and Sterling. And we'll be hearing more about how her legal career has developed shortly. Now, in creating this series, we've looked at the, some of the common hurdles that consultants can face. And this topic comes about because um, of the need to be aware that although many of you have had a lot of experience in previous working situations and have been comfortable in, in your own professional persona, our community of consultants can feel parachuted into very unfamiliar situations without the grace period of a full-time role or a, you know the induction process and as clients are typically general counsel from FTSE 100 companies, city law firms or startups, they all expect the consultants to hit the ground running and give value from the start. Um, and also in these particular roles there are the different ways of of working that you'll experience in, in these temporary roles. It may be full or part-time parts of the week. You may be working solely or as an additional member of an existing team. And it may be remote working or on site or a mixture of these variables. Also, you know, as a returner to the workplace for any number of variety of reasons, it can be feel very daunting to get back into the office or remote working after a period of absence. Now, um, before we get into the detail of this, we're going to hear a little from David and Charlene. David's going to give us an overview of how best to present ourselves in this in new and challenging situations. So, David. Thank you very much, Lucinda. I'd like to share some slides. Uh, Lucinda's right, I'm an Amazon best-selling author. I've got my new book coming up within the month. Uh, I was awarded one of the top 40 influencers for women in the banking space uh, last November by the Women in Banking and Finance Group. Uh, because typically my clients who I work with on a one-to-one -one basis are senior women who are struggling with um, being mansplained to, being trodden on when they're in a room, people assuming that they're not as bright as the men that they're, are in the room. Uh, and that's when those women are most likely to want to become less visible because of that kind of behavior. And that's when I step in and help them to become more visible and more in control of the visibility that they are creating on the basis that they want to create more value in an organization. And the majority of my clients have uh, achieved themselves some kind of uh, promotion uh, or increase in their payment. Often in their income streams, my clients have got an extra 100 to 300,000 as a result of our work together. And so, you know, I mean, raise your hand if you'd like that kind of uh, add-on in your life as a, you know, as I, either an employee or a consultant. Uh, so what I'd like to share with you today is um, making a great impact is, a, is about what I call the three pillars of impact. And this is almost always a starting point when I first meet a client. And the three pillars of impact are posture, voice, and energy yeah so 
uh, and often I, I put I put the Einstein quotes on, on there. There's another quote that I, uh, often I like to think about, which is, "When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change." And often it's about it's about looking at things from a different perspective, because the advantage that I have. Uh, when I walk into an organization is I'm not part of the structure of that organization. And I discovered this as, an, as a young actor and as a young theater director. Uh, I uh, trained professionally to be an actor back in 1990, next door to Daniel Craig and Ewan McGregor. Ewan McGregor I used to share a flat with. And, and I went to the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, which at the time was very much one of the top three conservatoire trainings in, uh, in the world. And by that, I mean the whole of the process was based around creating an ensemble working together rather than creating superstars. And that, was, that I thought was really helpful for me to understand when I started running my own theatre company and directing my own theatre, and I would see a group of actors on a stage and realize every single one of these people needs something different. And my job as the director is to know what it is that they need, to be able to recognize what they need and serve it to them in a way that allows them to grow. And I do exactly the same thing. When, when a client of mine calls me in and says, look, my, my boss is this, or my boss just demeaned me on Friday, I can go into that situation, look at that relationship, look at the construct of that organization from the outside. I can shine a light in the way that a director can shine a light on the actors who can't see the whole picture from the inside. So here's my one and only pie chart, which is the pie chart of Moravian and Ferris. Moravian and Ferris were a couple of uh, psychologists who in 1967, went to the Journal of Counseling Psychology with a pie chart of the communication of meaning in face-to-face -face conversation. So here we go. That This is what they are. The words, 7%, the vocal tonality, 38%, and the non-verbal behavior, 55%. Now, they, they came up with this in 1967, and everyone went, great, look at that. Communication, it's not about the words you say as long as you look good and you sound good. And then we end up with the politicians that we've got today, right? That's, that's not helpful. And in many ways, this has been debunked because, well, if it were true, then learning a foreign language would not be dif difficult, right? Where, where this has real value still for me is in first impressions and creating that first impression when you walk into a room. And so how long does it take to form an impression that's then difficult to shift, do you think? You know, have, have a think. How, how long does it take when you walk into a room or log into a, a, a Zoom or a Teams meeting before your impression is... So I've got something coming up in the Q&A. Yeah. So Eva, Evie was saying three seconds. Lovely, lovely. Three, I mean, three seconds, it's not long, right? Um, th there are studies that suggest that men make really quick decisions in seven, women, 14. Uh, and, and I think that's true. That's possibly true because men make, make the, their decisions on the basis purely of what they see because uh, because men have many more neural pathways feeding directly into the eye and not the rest of their brain, whereas women have neural pathways fed, if you like, equidistantly through, through the brain, um, which is why they take longer to make their first impression decision. Now, I use 23 seconds because 23 seconds is what Professor Alan Pease says in his uh, body language book that he rather helpfully calls the body language book. And in that body language book, it's like at 23 seconds, there's a switch, a switch that flicks in the listener that says, this person is worth my time or this person's not worth my time. And the basis of that is hardly ever the words. It's 
the, the vocal tonality and the nonverbal behavior and whether they are congruent with the words. So if I, if I can give you an example, my very first day at drama school back in 1990, there I was, mid 20s, well, in a room of, say, uh, I think it must have been 25 people. And we were doing our first lesson. We were all very, very nervous. We were all scared of each other and wanted to be liked by each other. And we were being, being told to do something and we were all doing it very badly. We had uh, an 80-year-old uh, female tutor swearing at us. We, we'd never had that before in our lives. Super nervous. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. And this guy burst in the door like this, going, sorry, I'm late. I did leave a message. And every single one of us in that room, right, right there, our, in our minds, we all said to ourselves, ooh, I don't like you. Which was a great shame because we were stuck with him for three years. He was stuck with us for three years. And it took a whole year to get over that one moment. Right? And the reason that that happened was because he used the word sorry, but was there anything in his vocal tonality or anything in his behavior that suggested he actually was sorry? Which is why I focus with my clients on, there we go, uh, on posture, voice, and energy. And just a little bit about me. This is me presenting in the days that we used to present uh, um face to face, these are some of the clients I am working with at the moment. Uh, this is my unique three-step system. My, if, if anyone were working with me as a client, typically we work together for three or six months. I show them how to speak impactfully so that they shine with an amazing level of influence, which allows them to make 10 times the difference in whatever the role is they are doing. And it's that 10 times the difference that means that they get significantly more income as a result. So the focus is on being more valuable so that when you ask for money, it's a no brainer to give it to you. And we do that through the posture, getting into a position of being absolutely solid and straight, present in yourself in order to have presence for other people. And then making sure your voice is working for you and creating that impression that means that every time you walk into a room, and I want to be really clear about this, every time you walk into a room, whether those people know you or, or don't know you, there's an opportunity to create a brand new first impression. And your tonality is often part of that. And having an energy because i know that people who are more energized are more successful and so walking into a room with energy uh coming into a zoom room with some energy about you means that you're going to draw the eye and have more of other people's ears yes and that which is the reason that i stand when i do all of these meetings because it's significantly easier for me to be energized in a standing position it's significantly easier for me to show my passion about uh, what it is that i do it's significantly easier for me to show people my hands than it is when i'm in a seated position and the hands are very important by the way because the unconscious mind follows the hands. I don't know if any of you have come across this before. The conscious mind follows eyes. The unconscious mind follows the hands. The unconscious mind also does not know that we are all in different rooms. The conscious mind does, but the unconscious mind does not. And so we want to show hands in order to create rapport significantly more quickly than over Zoom or over Teams than we can do if we don't let people see that. And that's, I think that's my big share, Lucinda, for today is always make sure that you, you can use those hands so that people can see that you are not a threat to them. Yeah, so that's a, 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 little, uh, a little run by the idea of your posture, your voice and your energy. And I'll stop sharing now. <laughs>
That's great. We'll certainly tap back into your um, observations as we discuss the the life cycle, as I will describe the of the role of the consultant. And I've got my hands. No, so yeah, that, that's great. And now I'm um, going to turn to Sharini. If you could tell us a bit more about your legal career, and um, I know you've got a particular interest in coaching through your work as an executive coach um, and how you approach this particular aspect of um, making a great impact in your in your role. I started my legal career probably like many people listening um, as a solicitor in the city and I trained at Norton Rose and then moved to Sherman and Sterling <clears throat> and then had a different career where I was in learning and development and I worked with with lawyers but on their leadership and their business skills and I, I thought that I'd actually given up law forever um, and then started my own business in learning and development but got pulled back into a an in-house maternity cover legal role um, and that kind of kick-started my in-house career um, and I worked in a few different in-house roles also in a boutique virtual law firm many years ago at the time when those things you know didn't really exist this was one of the first of its kind um, and I guess that's what that that's where I started consulting because it was a sort of similar model to obelisks but but many many years ago and I thought that it offered a huge sense of freedom for you as a lawyer because you could do bits of legal work but you could also do other things as well um, and I'm building a business as an executive coach. My, my particular interest is in supporting diverse people to be, to, to be in diverse leadership teams and seeing diverse leadership teams everywhere in all sectors and at all levels. Um, and, and coaching is one of the ways that I can help to make that happen. And I also do some facilitation and some consulting but I couldn't quite give up the legal work. So I'm still working um, with Obelisk as a consultant. Um, and I've had a brilliant um, few years actually at Obelisk. I've really enjoyed the work I've done. And I think to add to what David was saying about making um, a good impression, um, it's important to be enthusiastic about the work that you're doing and the client that you're working for and being in their team um, because often you're part of a very small team and they want you to, to come in and join them and, and love what they do, just as all their employees do. And, um, you know, that's something that everyone can do aside from, from the legal work is, is be motivated and be enthusiastic. Thank you. That is such a key point. And both of those um, insights that you've both given nicely intersect. And we're going to look now at um, how we can put these kinds of themes into to practice. Um, many of the skills obviously overlap. And I've rather divided it into four areas where we're going to look at the interview stage, the integration with new teams, how to particularly continue to inspire confidence in clients and these overarching elements being able to quickly build uh, successful productive working relationships, which essentially is building your reputation as a great legal consultant. Now, looking at the um, making a great impact in interviews, and we've heard from David about um, the posture, the voice and the energy. And um, it's obviously natural to feel anxious um, when you're going to interviews, particularly if certain ones haven't worked out in the past. And also the, the qualities of online interviews can be quite artificial. Um, the other thing I um, recall was doing um, when I was working uh, at Obelisk was the elements of competency questions which can throw people a bit if you are um, come from a time when people didn't ask that. So those are things perhaps to think about in advance. Um, and uh, Shalini, I think you've had um, experience where clients might have a different focus. So it's a question of, um, and, and again, this echoes what David was saying, is recognise the client's perspective. What are they, what are they looking for? Put yourself in their shoes. Are they also looking to fill a gap? Are they short staffed? Is it a business as usual project or a completely new project? So Charlene, I wonder if you could um, share some of your experiences from the interviews you've had. 
Yeah, so I've had lots of different kinds of interviews and some of the interviews have been with um, business people. So, for example, the CEO or the COO who isn't a lawyer. And in those interviews, I would say that what they were looking for was a good fit. Did I they sort of took the legal ability for granted. They'd seen my CV. They talked to an obelisk consult, uh, someone at obelisk. And now they wanted to see, would I be a good fit for them? Would I fit into their team? Did I have the kind of personal attributes that they were looking for? Um, and then I've had interviews with lawyers uh, who might pr well probe about specific areas of the law that they focus on. And what they want to know is, yes, are you a generalist, but can you do those specific areas? And in one case or two cases, actually, I couldn't really offer them exactly the experience they were looking for. And I think it's important to be really straightforward and upfront about what you can do, but also what you can't do and what you don't have experience of. Um, and in both cases, they decided not to use me because they said, you know, you, you would be a great fit, you have great legal experience, but we really need expertise in this particular area and you don't have it. Um, but then one of those clients that didn't take me on came back a couple of months later and said, look, we found a bit of extra money. We think you'd be brilliant not to do that work, but to do some other work in our team. Would you like to come and join us? Yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, just be prepared for everything. Um, also remember you're interviewing the client a bit to see whether you want to work there. Is it the right fit for you? Um, and, um, and be straightforward and honest. I think that's really helpful to, to explain that, that sort of range of where uh, things, you know, what, what they're looking for, does it work for you? but also conveying that authenticity and enthusiasm. And I imagine, David, that's something that you would wholeheartedly endorse. And, and is there um, a bit of a balance to be had, particularly online in trying to convey enthusiasm and um, commitment and, and how best to express that in your voice? So, uh, yes, I, I, uh, I totally agree. It's, it's always, you know, in, in, in the world of sales, and interviews really are sales, and uh, I, I like to think of sales as an opportunity to help more people rather than thinking of sales as an opportunity to make more money. Uh, and in, in a similar way to, the, uh, to what I said earlier about making 10 times the difference, if you, if you go to an interview on the basis of what's the difference I can make here and understanding that if you help enough other people you to have whatever it is they want then you get what you want and most often people focus on i want the job i want the job they focus on their own outcome rather than going into and and, and particularly if you're nervous that that focus takes you internal and i know i know far too well enough people who've gone into an interview having sat outside or sat waiting to go into a a, a video room going over in their heads constantly every single way i can cop this up every single way this can go wrong and what happens is the brain starts to believe that that's what you want and then starts delivering to you exactly what it believes that you want so you know the more people think don't screw up the more likely they are to screw up and and you know i once got a commercial i think it was the most money i ever earned for one day's work when i was an actor and I was absolutely certain I wasn't going to get the commercial. So I wasn't nervous at all. I thought it was a bit of a waste of time. And I walked in without having any of those nerves around me. And then later I got cast because I didn't have any of that kind of, oh, I'm, I must have this. I'm, I really want this to be the one that works. Energy going on around me. And so the more you focus, take your mind out of yourself and onto the the potential client and what are what are their problems what are their outcomes and am i a good match to resolve those problems and create an outcome and that's that's how they can find you a match you can find them a match and it's a, it's a great place to be focused on what's in it for them and does that fit with a way that then gets me what i want out of it 
Yeah, I think that's really, really valid. Um, and I would also urge people, I, I don't think we've got any um, particular questions at this point, but please do feel free to pop them in. Um, the, the Obelisk team are really happy to um, do practice interviews online, um, so you can rehearse things because it does these all these there are little bits if you haven't done it before it does trip you up even audio for example <laughs> but and lucinda on that point actually i was going to add talk to the obelisk team and find out about the client that you're meeting yeah. find out what they know about them and um, what they're like because that helps you to visualize what the interview might be like absolutely thank you for that um so we're now going to look at the um next stage you've got the job congratulations and this is really effective ways of integrating with your new team so um you know you've got the legal and the commercial um experience that they're looking for i've mentioned before that often there's no formal induction process or grace period um there's an expectation that you're the um, hired hand, you're going to hit the ground running. And also, the, the, you, there'll be a difference if you're going to be working by yourself or part of a group with an existing dynamic and, uh, dare I say, office politics, albeit online. So, Charlene, it would be helpful to hear from you from any variables you've come across and what your best practice observation mm. might be. Yeah, so I, I recently started a role working for a, a startup and um, it's all been remote. I haven't met anybody face to face. Um, and they, they really did understand that I would need an induction, but they had no idea what that induction should involve. So they asked me what I would like for my induction. So I think be ready to think widely what would help you um, on your induction so you can suggest things to them they do the obvious you know meeting certain key people but they might be there might be lots of other things you can think of that would help you so i did that and it definitely made a big difference and from that some other things emerged that i would need to know um, so particularly when you're going to be completely remote um, put a lot of thought into your induction because you're not going to have the opportunity to just bump into somebody and ask them a question in the office. Um, when I was working in a, in a different role that was face to face, um, that was with a big team and the general counsel had a really good idea of what an induction would involve and spent a lot of time on it. Um, so I got some really good ideas from that, I think, that I can take away into different roles. So I think sometimes if you're working in a, in a big legal team, there's a very established induction that they can take you through, but where you don't have that, the onus is more on you to think about what would help you. Yes, um, and one of the things I think um, is particularly important is establishing or understanding what the baseline effective levels of communication, so not only who to get your instructions and updates from, but also how this is achieved best have you got examples of different people using different tools these days yeah so actually the the, the um the work i'm doing at the moment has a very um it has a cap of hours over the month and so what what they've decided to do is channel all of their requests through one method in order to make sure that somebody is keeping an eye on the work that i'm doing and making sure that I'm only doing the most important work. And they only realized that when I started getting requests from loads of different people, but the COO didn't know about it. So we've had to kind of create this new channel for, for the work, for triaging the work. But in that same place, they use multiple modes of communication at the same time. So they use Gmail, telephones, um, Slack, and a couple of other methods. So you could get message simultaneously in a number of different ways by different people and that is difficult for somebody who's mainly worked on email really yeah. with the odd text message or phone call or whatsapp message but really email um, but when it became obvious that they had lots of different channels of communication I realized I just needed to sit down with someone and ask them well when do you use these different things and how do you use them and how does it work here and once they did that it became easier for me to, to kind of follow along with it. Yes, it's a question of having um, 
it's it's sort of an internal confidence and realizing I can only help you if I know the best way to help you and part of that is the office office set up and, and, and comms. Now, um, as we all might know and experience, you know, legal departments in particular in, in law firms or perhaps even in in-house can be quite competitive areas. Um, some people might see external people as a bit of a threat or they may be pro uh, protective over their workload or, or indeed other um, tensions. And I think um, one of the things you've thought about, Charlene, is, is, is a question of, um, so sort of having the confidence in your role as a as a freelance that the business has a business case for wanting you and and really it's a recognition of people's style um, as much as their role would you say that's something you've you've come across yes I mean I think when I've worked in big teams they've been delighted to have the consultants there because usually there's too much work for them to handle and so they're they're really happy to have people around who are experienced lawyers who, with a bit of help, can run with some mm. some quite tricky um, pieces of work. Um, and in one of the one of the roles that I've done, um, the general counsel took it as an opportunity, having this resource to do some of the projects that nobody else in the team actually wanted to do, but which I was actually really interested in. So that that worked out brilliantly for them because. None of them had to do these projects. They, they really wanted to be doing the transactions. I was really happy to do the projects. And so they could see how it was, it was a good resource for the team, that, that someone else was doing some important things that meant that they didn't have to do it, actually. Mm -hmm. And David, in, in terms of your experience, um, you mentioned in the, your presentation about the visibility and shining a, a light on yourself and, and others. Would you say that this is where this can come, come, to, come to the fore? Yes, I would. It's, yeah. it's about being certain of the visibility you want to create. Mm -hmm. And what, what I'll often do at the beginning of a relationship with a client is work on what are the values that other people see in you already? And what are the values that you wish that they saw in you? Because if you can be clear about the values that you want to represent when you're in a room, then you're much more likely to embody it. Because you can then go, oh, okay, well, if this is a value, you know, if the value is integrity or the, the value is passion or the value is, is credibility or the value is certainty, you, you know, immediately you start thinking of people you might know who have these values and you can start thinking, well, what do they look like? What do they sound like? What's it like to be in a room with them? And what, what can I take from that so that I can appear and have these values for the benefit of the people who I'm going to be working with? You're right, as a consultant, you walk into an organization and shine a light yeah. that often you can't see from on stage, from being being part of part of the whole you can walk in and see the whole and say that ah, that's interesting if you you know as a director i'd always say if you step if you step two paces forward when you say that line you will be in light and the line won't be wasted and, mm -hmm. and so it's a, it's a similar thing here that if you've got to make sure you are in the right kind of light for showing yourself off at the very best of your ability when you do choose to speak yeah. Otherwise, it goes to waste. Mm. And that and that echoes the point you made about having congruency with your um, physical posture as well as what you're saying. So it sort of amplifies it, I'm guessing. And also the point that you made, Charlene, about getting a, um, an overview of what the company or the organisation, what their values are, and either certainly ask the obelisk team, but also be something to ask in, a, in, 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 a, in an interview. I think that's quite a compelling question to hear what are your corporate values, because it may, you can then reflect it back and embody that and say, well, I know one of it is X, yeah. how do you want me to do it in this work? I mean, I'm just speculating, it may not always be relevant. Um, now, do we have- And it also helps you choose, Lucinda, if you don't mind my saying it. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you, you can ask that question in an interview and get an answer and then think, I'm really not sure I want to embody those values. No. So it's really useful from both ends of that kind of fi finding the match. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is certainly the good match element there. Now, coming on to um, 
the third point about techniques for inspiring confidence with clients and I'm sure everyone's thinking well you know you picked up things along the way but um, uh, my understanding is really it's, it's a question of who is the person that's going to um, help you succeed and what is the clarity and do they give you sufficient clarity of instructions both in, in what the job is they want you to do and the time frame. And again, that come, comes back to working out the preferences. Um, Charlene, how do you see that bearing out in terms of um, establishing these, these uh, good relationships and, and confidence with clients? Um, well, well, one thing that, that sort of... Um, sort of adds on to what you were saying Lucinda is, is that it, never be afraid to ask a question so if, if you don't understand something as a consultant it's really important not to soldier on in the dark but to find out what the answer is and um, you know do your own thinking beforehand as you would in any job and then ask the bits that you don't understand and do it early um, because you're trying to do the job as efficiently as possible. And the longer that you spend worrying about something and not doing it, the more you're not really being efficient. So that's important. And also to really understand who the right point of contact is and, and how, the, how the contact should work. Um, and who will be able to give you an answer really quickly? Because there's no point contacting somebody that's not going to get back to you. You need to understand who who's there to really help you to do the work. Because in my experience, they want you to do a good job and they're really rooting for you. They also understand you might need some help, but they're waiting for you to come and ask for it. So the, the onus is, I think, on the consultant to make sure that they do go and ask whenever there's a question. And that does inspire confidence and builds the relationship because then your boss knows that they can trust you to come and ask when you need to. Yeah, it's a tangible evidence that you're trying to further the job, get it done. But I think sometimes people can also forget in the um, that people don't have that osmosis element of all the corporate or organisational knowledge and there'll be key missing gaps that they might need to be able to get the work done. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also going to touch on, you know, managing problems and how to inspire confidence because pr problems are inevitable. Um, you know, roadblocks or, or things that, dare I say, it might go wrong. Um, and if you haven't got um, a good communication background, it can make it an even more of a messy situation and more complicated and, and difficult. Um, Charlene, what advice do you have if, if people come across problems um, and to prevent them from escalating, would you say? Well, I mean, I don't think this is going to be news to anybody, but, but reveal them early. Go and say that you have found a problem or you think you've made a mistake and what can you do about it? And, you know, that's happened to me. Um, I, I believe it will continue to happen because we're human beings and we all make mistakes. Um, and that what I guess I've got now, which perhaps I didn't have as a really junior lawyer, is the confidence to go and say, look, I think I've done this wrong, or I think there's a problem. What, what can we do about it? How can we solve it? And, you know, I, I as, as a leader and a boss, know that I would much rather hear about it early than hear about it later on. And I suppose I take that view into when I'm acting as a consultant and I think there's an issue um, to just be confident about speaking up. Mm. Mm. I think that's really important to know and, and remember that pe people do make mistakes. As you say, it sounds like it's so obvious, but it's, it's really important. And to, to say things like that, what do you think? Or can you give me a few pointers? Can you give me a steer? I mean, this is obviously not if the problems happen, but if, you, if you're anticipating problems ahead. David, what are your thoughts about... Um, effective communications at points of stress or uncertainty or um, when indeed things have gone wrong? It's a great question because there are places that when we're we're stressed and we're nervous about how people are going to respond when if you know if, if I'm honest and reveal I've made a mistake how are they going to respond to me and and so that fear often gets in the way or people try and hide 
what's going on, like uh, Charlene says, it's uh, it, be honest uh, straight away. And then it kind of, it, that the moment that you've said it out loud, it kind of, it has less purchase on you as a human being. Now, what makes people feel confident is the person who shows up. You know, and so we are naturally rapport building human beings. We typically will um, copy the breathing pattern of the people who are most dominant in a room. And so how you show up when you're admitting to a, a, a mistake or how you show up to generate confidence with a group of people in a room is often based around how are you breathing? Because whatever, how, whatever you are breathing in, whether it's deep into the stomach, nice and slow, or whether it's high in the chest and the heart rate high, you're going to generate that in the room. The moment you start speaking, you're going to generate whatever you bring. So bring that calm energy, even if you don't feel calm inside, you know, use, use uh, some of the, some of the breathing work. I know there's lots of breathing work out there on YouTube and I, uh, I run through uh, a lot of Alexander Technique work that I do with my clients on, which it was taught to me by Patsy Rodenberg, who was Barack Obama's voice coach, you know, and worked with him at a time when everyone around him was going, this guy's got no charisma. He, how, how can he influence people? Come on, really? And, and the the breathing stuff really works to kind of get you in a space where you can then go, okay, so I, I now step out of my comfort zone. But by the way, if you want more out of life, more, whether it be, you know, more responsibility or more money, you're going to have to spend more time out of your comfort zone and get used to reflecting a person who's comfortable being out of their comfort zone. And so that always starts with the breath. And can you get your breath nice and low, reduce your internal temperature, get full access to the entirety of your brain, which you don't have when you're breathing in the chest, then you're going to, you're going to inspire much more confidence when you step into that room. Yeah. It's interesting. Those sort of physiological um, modulations can give you such sort of tangible benefits. Um, and um, I'm guessing sort of the more you can practice, out of that context, yeah. not that you need to necessarily practice doing things wrong, but think about things, you know, in circumstances um, before they happen. Now, uh, looking at the the end point, the sort of more global creating good working relationships. Obviously, it's a sum of the various elements we've discussed, um, and I think, in particular, it's this notion of. Uh, can be summarized as developing a self-awareness um, and a reading of others um, and allow that to become a tool rather than just um, a sort of artificial construct. You know, consultants may often feel that they don't have a position of power because they are the hired hand, but you can um, stand in a position of power by as you've explained, David, by you know having that sense of identity, self of awareness, and retain that sort of visibility, I think that's quite a important point to to stress. But also this element of reading another person's style. Um, now, in terms of um, creating these good relationships in a team. And I know obviously Charlene, you discussed sort of the lack of on-site um, presence. Um, can you think how that could be translated into this sort of more remote? Um, what I'm thinking of, um, even in a team dynamic, I think you've, you've mentioned in the past me before where some people were perfectly competent, but they, became difficult to work with because of their approach. And I think you, you, you said they sort of sucked the joy out of the room. Can you tell us a little more about that experience and what your thoughts were about that? Well, I, I think um, I won't go too much into that experience, but what I really learned from it was that um, 
it's important to show up and be yourself and be and want to be part of the team and treat it as if you 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 know you are a part of the team and I know you said that consultants are hired hands and they're, they're seen as such but my experience is that you're you're pretty much seen as part of the, the team from day one and that um you know it's a really the, the work I've done at Obelisk has always been uh in places that are really welcoming to the consultants and want them to be part of the team. So then it's important to be part of the team, otherwise you're not fulfilling the role that mentally they have for you. Um, and another thing that I, I noticed was that I, uh, you know, bring, your, bring all your talents to the job. And if one of your talents, for example, is um, kind of seeing how things could be better organized, well, why don't you talk to someone about your ideas and say, you know, here's how you might think about tweaking this or doing it a bit differently. Um, because sometimes they've been doing things the same way for so long, they haven't had a chance to think about fresh ideas from outside. So sometimes your different perspective on something can can be really thought provoking and can make people think, actually, we could just tweak this for it and it could be a bit better. So, you know, don't be afraid to use whatever you can see could be better as an opportunity for a conversation. Yeah, I'm glad you um, picked me up about saying that people don't regard people as a hard hand. I think that's a very important point to make. Um, and I think um, I remember one of the really useful things that your, one of your organisations um, said was that you helped formulate all their documents and made a suggestion about having things in, in a sort of useful place. And that sounds pretty obvious, but for a startup or some businesses mm. very quickly, that was something you could see as an outsider. Yeah, yeah this was a startup and, and somebody who wasn't a lawyer had been filing all of the legal documents, but had been putting them in different places. And also there wasn't really any way that they could easily retrieve things um, and quickly. So when they wanted to look at what they'd agreed with that same client last year, they couldn't find it. And so we're working on how can we actually make this repository much easier for everyone to search and file in so that when I'm gone, you can easily find all your legal documents again. Um, and, you know, I know how to do that. I know how to do it really quickly. They probably don't. So that's where I can add some value. Yes, and I think also a really important point to make is where consultants um, have worked in different environments, you sort of bring in a whole set of skills that, you know, other people can't see from it. One sector, you may think, well, have you thought about doing that? you're building um, added value for them and also you're perhaps suggesting extra work that they may be you know when they have the money to be able to do. Um, David can I um, talk to you about um, the phenomenon for particularly for freelance consultants in, in building their own reputation and using the effective uh, means of communication because it is obviously you, you, you important to establish these uh, good working relationships people will remember you and, and maybe think of you and specifically ask you I know that has happened at Obelisk where people say what about so-and-so our, our great Charlini for example is she available yes yeah absolutely we, and, and again that's about who shows up yeah you know because if you if you're building a business by reputation that means that then you can get recommended to find other clients or you, you might want to network with other professionals, be seen as the person who maybe gives a little bit more than most, that to be known for being generous and having what I call a, a, a palm down experience rather than a palm up experience, you know, rather than going begging for work, going with a with a giving hand of what what can I do for you, mm. and that's and that kind of space where the the majority of the world spend their time building a reputation online. I say spend your time building your reputation offline by speaking to more people and showing people the possibilities of what they could have if you were in their life in some way. Yeah. You know, so it's about the value you do bring, the value you could potentially bring, and who are the advocates around the table who are going, oh, do you know who'd be perfect to bring in on this? Yeah. You know, because impact is about what happens when you're in the room and it influences about what happens when you're not. Yeah. 
And that, that influence can only come through the writing practice. Yeah. I think that's um, really important because those are, they lend themselves to personal qualities that one can, you know, identify and, and develop. You know, you, it is taken as a given in our sector that you'll have the legal knowledge and um, obviously the, the question of commercial awareness that comes through experience. Um, but it is this element of inspiring confidence um, about your competence, building trust, clear lines of uh, effective communication. Um, now, I just wonder if we could touch on um, before... Um, the end is, is some of uh, our consultants are in a paralegal situation. So they haven't had years of experience as um, lawyers. And so they might find um, perhaps it even more daunting, but they have their own personalities, of course. They have their own um, uh, attributes in that regard. And um, you mentioned Charlene, there is a disadvantage sadly at the moment where people can't learn these by osmosis, but how, what sort of advice would you perhaps, I know I'm putting you a bit on the spot, for you know, the, the more junior end of, of our um, consultant group? Um, it's a good question. And I actually do a lot of training with trainees in, in some of the big law firms. Um, and, and, you know, they're often starting their first legal job and many of them have never had much experience. They, they might have had a week or two working in a law firm, but this is their first real experience of what it's like as a job. And they have many things they can bring. So they can bring their personality. They can bring their enthusiasm. Um, they can bring, you know, their thinking skills. So to do as much thinking about a problem that they've been given as they can before they ask a question. Um, they can bring their initiative. They can, you know, there, there are so many personal qualities that they can bring aside from their legal knowledge. Um, and so I, I try and encourage everyone to feel confident that they've got all of those things in the bag already. And also to think about other things that they've done outside of this particular job, other work they've done, the qualities and the skills that they've developed through that. And to remember that they've got all those things and not to feel that they're at a huge disadvantage because they don't have years and years of legal experience. So to try and see themselves as a whole human being and bring in all of the other qualities and skills that they've got maybe from outside of this job. I think that's really helpful. How about you, David? What, what words of help can you and wisdom can you offer our, our more junior colleagues? Yeah, is to believe in yourself, actually. And uh, that's when, when you're young. And I, I know from having worked with graduates in some of the, in, you know, Barclays and some of the bigger uh, banks that that the people who come in at graduates usually have the most amazing ideas that they then somehow learn not to articulate and, and so articulate be confident and art, articulate ideas show them the energy that your youth can bring into an organization if it's a, if it's attractive to them to be in that energy then they'll they'll want more of you around yeah I think that's, I think that's really helpful. And um, again, I would say that, that the Obelisk team are, are here to support you and um, part of your network. So please, um, you know, talk to the team. And I think one of these elements of mentoring, you know, they could perhaps if you wanted to talk to somebody who's been in that role before or something similar, sharing experiences is really, really um, important. Um, now, we don't think we've got any active questions at the moment, so um, we've only got a few minutes left, but um, I just want to say a, a real thank you to uh, David and Charlene. That's been so kind of you to share your thoughts and experience in Wisbon. David, you can find out more about his work on his website, davidroylance.com, and your new book, be seen, be heard, and get paid for what you're worth. When is that coming out? Remind us. So, a wonderful question. It's uh, the moment publication date is November 29th. Excellent. Now, I am taking out the first thousand of the print route run to give as gifts Ooh. to people, majority women, who I meet. Uh, now, I have a landing page which should be going up over the next couple of days. Uh, but I wonder if it might be possible to circulate that and say, if you want a free copy of this book, please 
um, please register on the landing page when it goes active, uh, which will be be seen, be heard, get paid what you're worth .com. But if I can, I circulate that through Obelisk. Yes, we we have a weekly newsletter, so we can put that in, and that will be. That's very generous of you. That's very kind of you to share the join. We've had um, comment in our Q and A. Really helpful from Sarah. Thank you. That's that's good to know. That's helpful. Um, and uh, where are we? So, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, and Charlene, you can be contacted by LinkedIn. Yes, just on LinkedIn. Just just message me on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's that's a very effective way of doing it. So, um, this recorded session will be added to the Move the Needle series on Obelisk's YouTube channel and joins previous episodes of Building Stronger Relationships at Work and um, Resilience. And um, I think they, having watched them, they there's overlapping themes and different perspectives, which is always useful to to gather. Um, there'll be more resources on the Attic blog posts. And again, I wish reiterate the help from the Obelisk team. If you'd like to let us know of any other topics you'd find helpful to uh, develop your career, please do always get in contact with us. But thank you so much for joining us. And um, thank you again. Thank you, David. Thank you, Charlene. Thank, thank you, Lucinda. Pleasure. Thank you, Lucinda. Very lovely to be here.